Cushing with the EI Commander and Andy Carmi, who was kind enough to host us, and we really appreciate that, Andy. Um, we are going to talk about, um, and I'm going to use the same presentation I, I gave at uh, Oshkosh last year, and I will hopefully give again 2018. Um, we're going to talk about the timing basics, um, retarding and advancing timing, charge density versus fuel air, all this good stuff, really the things that impact timing and that you need to be aware of. At the end, if we have time, and I'm sure we will, we can talk about the, um, the PMAG um, and what it can do. I don't really want to turn this into an EI Commander sales pitch. We will talk about it and w what it can do, but it, again, I, I don't want this to be an EI Commander sales pitch. If we have anybody who's joined us who has a different ignition, um, feel free when we get to the Q&A section to chime in. I'm sure a lot of people will ask questions. I, I don't want to make this a PMAG versus uh, G3 or G3X, uh, again, you know, a, a PMAG versus any other ignition kind of discussion. The things that I'll talk about uh, regarding the ignition and timing are relevant for all ignitions, whether you have a fixed fixed time magneto or light speed or what have you. So let's go ahead and move forward then. So, you know, the first thing that, and again, this is some of the stuff's very basic. So top dead center, the piston's at the very top of its travel, and we call that zero degrees or, or 360, so it's kind of how, how you want to talk to it. Um, 45 degrees after top dead center, and you'll see the piston's coming around um, and, and keeps going around. So 180 degrees after top dead center. And notice we're still after top dead center. Well, the funny thing is it's also before top dead center. So um, 335 degrees after top dead center is, is also 25 degrees before top dead center. And we, once we start coming, the piston is coming up towards the firing angle, we refer to that as before top dead center. All right, so that's pretty straightforward. You hit top dead center, pressure builds, and then um, we start coming after top dead center and, and go. So, so the trick really here is, Based on cylinder design, uh, diameter, piston speed, head design, all of those things contribute to um, how or when you should fire your ignition, um, as well as spark plug design. Everything, um, all of these things take into account. Our engines are fairly slow turning, as you know, in terms of automotive engines. We have very large diameter pistons. The pistons in a, um, in a 360, an 0360 and 0320, I think are five and an eighth inch diameter pistons. I, I have one in my hanger. I was going to bring it in to hold up for everybody to see, but that's irrelevant for, for this discussion. So the real goal is to figure out at what point before top dead center to fire the plugs so the flame front can propagate <laughs> across the piston as it comes up and create maximum pressure at that magical point about 15, 13 to 15 degrees after top dead center. And it turns out I, I checked with um, Alan Barrett and asked him when exactly the exhaust valve opens. And he had said around 180 degrees after top dead center. But the goal is, as I said, due to friction and a number of other things, is to have maximum cylinder pressure after top dead center. Now, if you like the fire, um, say, you know, again, this, for this illustration, we show 25 degrees. If you were to light the fire um, at, say, 30 degrees before top dead center, then what happens is this flame front really starts to expand, and, and it doesn't explode, but it burns across the face of that piston, creating pressure. And so now the piston's got to compress it more as it comes up and then, and then come, comes back down. So if you're running um, the wrong timing, so if you've got um, a parallel valve, we'll talk about that, a parallel valve engine where the recommended timing is 25 degrees before top dead center, and you're running your PMAGs without the jumper in, in the standard configuration, it's firing a little bit before 31 degrees. So you're creating a lot of pressure before top dead center, and your maximum pressure 
is happening well before that 15 degrees. So you're not really burning real efficiently. And you'll see that as high cylinder head temperatures. And again, not just any, not just the PMAG, but any ignition that you're firing well before it should, um, you're going to wind up with high cylinder head temperatures. Now, conversely, if you fired a 25 degree engine uh, at 20 degrees, so um, an angle valve engine, any angle valve, an IO360 200 horse or the, the um, 390s that the RD14 require, if you were firing that timing at um, or using that timing on a parallel valve, you're not going to have maximum pressure until way after that magical 15 degrees. So what happens there is um, you're not getting maximum pressure at that magical 15 degrees after top dead center, and your cylinder head temperatures are probably going to be lower than they should be. So I hope that that's clear. So, um, and, and like I said, you know, maximum torque at about 15 degrees after top dead center. So our engines really run on torque. You know, that's just the way they are. We, we always brag about horsepower, but they really run on torque. Um, retarding the time, okay, means to delay the firing event until closer to top dead center. And so, as I said, um, if standard timing for 25 degrees is a parallel valve engine, 20 degrees for an angle valve. The things that impact that will be if you have high compression pistons. So if you put high compression pistons in a 25 degree parallel valve engine, maybe your timing should be closer to top dead center, and I'll explain why in a minute. Maybe it should be 22 or 23 degrees. So that's, that, that's what it is. So advance the timing is, um, is uh, you know, firing it well before that, that uh, theoretical best timing, okay? So again, you're going to burn more fuel air. You're going to spend, you know, cylinder C, uh, EGTs are going to go up, um, and, it, and it can eventually harm an engine. So, as I said earlier, the things that impact your timing, um, piston size, cylinder head design, uh, compression ratio, a lot of these things, volume, fuel, air mixture, um, um, the amount, the total amount of fuel air, not your ratio. So, for those of you who are running an angle valve engine, you can go to your local uh, um, RAM dealership and get a HEMI sticker because the the reason an IO360 angle valve produces 200 of a horse and a parallel valve IO360 only produces 180 is because the angle valve engines have a hemispherical head, so they're more efficient. A engine is nothing but an air pump, so the easier it is to get fuel and air in and out of it, the more efficient it's going to run. Um, so that's why. Um, getting your timing right is so important. So a 30 degree timing, uh, which is what the B curve is, and we'll show you that in a minute, is perfect for a Continental A65 engine. Real low compression, like six to one. A standard parallel and angle valve engine, about eight and a half to one compression. Um, at least the parallel valve is. I think, I think the angle valve is about the same. I'd have to look it up. Um, so let's see. Um, you know, a little detail here, you know, typical fuel air ratio, perfect air ratio um, for a gasoline engine, the rate it burns is 16 and a half meters per second squared. So, as I said, the, the fuel air mixture doesn't explode in the, in, the piss, in the cylinder, it burns. And where this becomes um, important is, um, you know, watching your CHETs and EGTs. So, if you light your, if you light your fire too early, and it has to compress the expanding air, uh, fuel air mixture as it comes up, you're going to see high CHTs, too late, and, and usually lower EGTs. If it's too late, what's going to happen is you're going to see your CHTs drop, but your EGTs are going to go up. And my apologies, the reason I look off to the side is because that's where my speaker is. So if you, if you um, light it too late, as I said, your CHTs will go down, your EGTs will go up uh, compared to what's ideal. Now, that will not hurt the engine. Lighting it um, too far in advance of top dead center can damage your engine. Uh, lighting it uh, later and you know, closer to, to um, top dead center will not hurt your engine. Um, you, know, you may have some exhaust, gas, you know, exhaust valve issues, but um, for 
the most part, that's pretty safe. Um, the uh, um, the other thing is you will lose power if you're not you know, again you're going to lose power if you set it too much advanced, and you'll lose power if you have it too little advanced. Um, so so this is my little diagram of downloads. So this is why vacuum advance on any electronic ignition is a good deal, right? So down low your fuel air charge. And that's the little blue and blue red uh, dots here in the cylinder um, are tightly packed. So when you light that fire, so when you're at takeoff power, you have high manifold pressure. And um, um, what happens is those fuel air molecules are closer together. That flame front will propagate fairly quickly. It'll jump between um, molecules pretty quickly. So things that can impact that if you have turbocharger or supercharger and nitrous is just like the uh, turbo or supercharging the engine. It is adding essentially a, very, a lot of oxygen. So if you want to run nitrous, you also have to introduce fueling. And you probably don't want to fire your ignition. And again, I'm re referring to parallel valve engines, that 25 degree engine, 25 degrees. Um, somewhere closer to 20 for a parallel valve engine with standard compression is probably ideal if you're running nitrous. Um, so as you climb in altitude, those fuel air molecules get further and further apart. So it takes longer for the flame front to propagate um, across your cylinder. So what that means is instead of lighting the fire at 25 degrees, like you can in this picture, you could probably light it at 30 or more degrees because again, those fuel air molecules are further apart. They take longer to burn. So as that piston comes up to top dead center, you know, the goal again is to create maximum pressure at about 15 degrees after top dead center. So um, because there's, you know, the fuel and, air, fuel and air molecules are further apart, you can light it further from top dead center to maximize that max pressure afterwards. Okay. Um, so specific timing is based again on air density, fuel air mixture, um, the you know, and uh, um, piston and cylinder head design. So I've got in there um, 30 degrees for Continental A65, if you're wondering, 25 degrees for a Lycoming, and these are standard compression, and 20 degrees for an angle valve with 8.7 8 to 1. And, uh, and that goes for 360 or the 390, I think even the 400. I think they're all about the same compression ratio. So those who own it will have to tell me I, I didn't really look them up for this presentation. Um, at low power settings, Lima Peak or Richard Peak operations, these all impact um, what time you want. The dispersed fuel um, air molecules, again, equals slow flame propagation. And that happens, again, as you climb. Um, so your goal um, when you do that kind of stuff is, again, and I keep stressing this, to maximize your peak pressure after TDC, okay? So this is kind of a fun slide, right? I, I argue with, this, with people on this all the time, and uh, Dan Horton and I have had this discussion, Dan, I hope you're on the call. Um, so traditional medios versus electronic ignition, uh, electronic ignition, ignitions. You'll hear people will say, hey, my electronic ignition produces more power than uh, my old slicks. Well, the truth is, you like the fire, you like the fire. If you, I will, would argue, if you had slicks and you stayed in the pattern, did nothing but take off and landings like a student pilot for an hour uh, with slicks, and then changed them out for an electronic ignition that advances based on manifold pressure, they, and if they're set up properly, the base timing when you go full throttle should be the same. And you're probably going to burn the same amount of fuel on both events. Now, what happens is as you go up high and cruise, the fixed time ignition is firing the magnetos at a less than optimal time. Again, all because the fuel air uh, molecules are not dispersed or are dispersed and you're wasting um, a lot of heat. With the electronic ignition, because it can advance and allow your ignition to uh, light that fuel air charge um, well before uh, the high uh, 
the um, excuse me the high uh, power takeoff setting, um, it just burns more efficiently. You know, in, if you go look at the forum, you'll hear a number of people will say that when hey they put in one electronic ignition and they gained about a gallon an hour, they put in two, they gained a gallon a gallon and a half plus or minus an hour. Um, and that's assuming everything's set and timed properly. That's because they're spending more time at cruise. Rarely do we spend our, our time in our, in our airplanes because we're not student pilots sitting in the pattern doing smash and goes. Okay. So, Andy, can you, um, let's see, participants, I want to unmute this thing. So, we should. Great. Can you, can you unmute us, Andy? Yeah, I can unmute everyone if you want. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Okay, here we go. Okay, is everyone still with us? Yep. Yep. Great, thank you for joining us. Any questions about what I covered? So if you hook a little uh, mini voltmeter to a PMAG and watch the advance, does that give you an idea and cruise of what it's doing? No. The, um, the PMAG is, is a digital um, ignition. So a voltmeter meter is being a, an analog device. The way that we do it with the EI Commander is pins 2 and 3 on the PMAG are a serial output. And so the PMAG is designed to uh, put the, or the EI Commander is designed to put the PMAGs in streaming mode, and it can dis and it does display um, the uh, uh, current timing on both ignitions simultaneously. So, but you can't you can't do it with a simple uh, voltmeter. Okay. So, so sorry. Um, yeah, we when we developed the. Um, the EI commander, I got a hold of Klaus and asked if there was any way for us to design um, the, you know, to, to take into account a mixed environment. And the reality of it is, is with two different timing curves, we really can't do it. Um, the the uh, light speed, as good of an ignition it is, it is an analog system, and the PMAGs are a digital system. So, anyone else? Well, what sorts of things do you see if uh, you know you have two ignitions and they're not synced up really well? Um, the reality of it is, is a pilot probably would never notice the difference. Um, you have one that's going to fire first and one that's going to fire later. So, let's say you have um, um, uh, oh, I can't think of the guy's name in Canada that's got his own ignition that's the hot setup right now. Um, Ross. Ross, thank you. <laughs> um, so say you put Ross's ignition in and you put a light speed or a PMAG. Because they don't have the same timing curve, one is going like to you know, sort of light the fuel before the other. Um, the other one might still get, depending on how much it's lagging, it, uh, it might still get uh, some burn going. But um, in terms of maximum efficiency, your best bet is with two identical ignitions firing at the same time. And I don't care whose ignition it is, it just, that's the way, you know. Although, one caveat, I'm saying two electronic ignitions. You're going to gain it quite a bit by having one electronic and one, um, one electronic and one traditional magneto over two uh, traditional mags. But if you're going electronics, it's best to have um, them probably firing at the same at the same time, and there's no real way unless you know unless uh, Ross and he's got I'm sure he's got the capability to do this if you if you wanted to it would be to map out what the PMAG's doing every instance and then um, time his to match the PMAG, and that sort of defeats the purpose of his ignition. So. You're running two P mags and you don't have an EI commander. Can you tell if they're firing at the same time? Nope, you cannot. Okay. You you time them the same, 
at the you know just like the standard magneto and and that's it. I think I may have a picture. I put some other things on here. Of it. Yes. So um, so if you look up here, the, the version two, which is available, Stein sells it. Um, the original version uh, you can get from Aircraft Spruce. We've got a couple of these in the field, but I'll, I'll pick up on this one just simply because it's a better display. Um, it looks up here. You can see that. So in this case, this bar graph, it's bright red. What we do is we listen for the trailing edge of the tack signal on the PMAC, and that's when number one cylinder fires. And what we've discovered is that there's so much slop in the gear train that the ignition firing event, whether it's a standard slope or PMAGs or whatever, varies about a degree and a half. So anything below, if this was, again, we set this up just to get a picture of it, typically this will be green and the bar graph will be at 2 degrees and the 7.0 will be at 2 degrees. Okay. In this case, if I was flying and I had this, I would be questioning what's going on with my ignition. These two boxes, red on the bottom for the left, green on the top for the right, is showing the ignition advance. Now, in this case, the um, if I had an angle valve, this is probably where I'd be, want to be running in uh, on a high-power takeoff setting. Now, this bar graph, you can kind of see it better on the side. We put four bar graphs here. Um, the PMAGs use an ODP2 style, um, automotive style coil pack. So it can report uh, what's happening with the ignition. So if you had a, a foul plug, this bar graph, because the amperage going through it would be at 100%. If you had a broken plug lead, a broken wire that fell off, it'd be at zero. Typically, you and this is all we did was take their numbers since they don't really mean anything and set them to a hundred point scale. So typically, you're running in and around this green box in the middle. And what we've discovered is that um, if you run a set of spark plugs, and and I, I tell you, but I recommend that just just get the NGK BRAESs. Don't don't get anything fancy. Um, you'll see when you when you put in a new set of plugs, they're, they're up here, and as they deteriorate, they'll run down. I don't know if you, can you see my mouse, Andy? Yeah, that looks good. Good. Okay, they'll start to deteriorate, and, and um, I usually fly about 130 hours a year unless I break my airplane. And um, I took a set of eight, and um, my partner Ed is um, he flies behind a rotary, and and in the rotary world, there is a known as an engine sag, and it's a common problem. They, you know, everybody tries to figure out why these things apparently just sort of sag a little bit. And one of the rotary guys is a PhD college professor in mechanical engineering who's also a major gearhead. So we sent him all eight of my spark plugs and, to, and asked him to tell us what's going on with them. And the answer was that the metal electrodes both the little hook over the top and the pin in the middle were fine. Very little erosion on them. What he found, I think, if I remember right, was that the insulation was going bad, and that was allowing the plugs to start to deteriorate. So we simply, in my mind, when people ask, I recommend that they change the plugs at about 100 hours or yearly. You know, if you fly 50 hours a year, then twice a year, or every two years, change the plugs. It's less than 20 bucks for a set of eight. Just throw them away. It doesn't seem to matter whether um, they're iridium plugs or platinum or whatever. They all kind of act the same. So, any questions about that? Okay. If if this PMAG was in an airplane that was flying and you get up high and say this is an angle valve, the, these numbers would go up um, probably 10 degrees in cruises as you're up high and manifold pressure is dropping off. One of, the, one of the biggest questions I get about the PMAG is why these weird numbers, 19.6? Well, the PMAG to, to speed up the processing does everything at the byte level. And so if you took 360 degrees divided by 256, you get 1.4 degrees. So everything the PMAG does is a 1.4 degrees increment. Okay? So let's see what we got. So we're not going to do a demo. Um, let me back up here. So what I did, to, um, so Andy and I were discussing my, uh, I'm replacing the engine mount on my airplane. So my engine's hanging on a engine hoist right now. 
and I put the PMAGs on it, or I put the uh, downloaded the EICAD program, and I grabbed the older one, um, and attached to one of them just to see um, and to show you what the standard program works. Now this is free from EMAG. The downside of this is you cannot run this while you're while the engine is running. You have to do it when everything's shut down. So in this case, this is off of one of my uh, recent PMAGs, or my PMAGs, which I recently had upgraded to version 41. So, and all this stuff is, um, you can change all of this stuff with the EI Commander, uh, and you can do it in flight if you want. We don't really recommend that. We'd rather see you do it on the ground. So, in this case, a standard no jumper PMAG. Um, run mode start delay is zero. So, this says how many revolutions do you want the engine to go through before it fires a plug? In this case, the first firing event it sees, it will fire it. I don't recommend you changing that. We had um, a customer who set it to two, and he was getting backfiring because it was pouring raw fuel out of the exhaust, and when the exhaust would light off, it would, or when the ignition would light off, um, any leftover exhaust in the exhaust, or fuel in the exhaust stack would light off with a bang. Sensor mode is just an internal thing. Leave that there. We, we don't allow you to change it. Tack pulses for revolution. The default is two. Uh, um, Tack voltage. Obviously, nothing's going on because it's not really running. So the advanced shift, and I'll come back to this, is 4.2. The maximum RPM is 33.28, and the max advance limit is 40.6. So this 4.2, I'm going to come over here to, I'm going to switch pages here. So, can everybody see that? Maybe a little small. Um, okay, there we go. No, that's not. That's right. That'll make it a little bit bigger for you. All right. So, what's happening here? So with the standard timing on the PMAG, if you set it to top dead center, is 26.6 degrees. With that no jumper in, it brings it down. Notice this. This is 4.2 degrees. So you start here on 30.8 degrees. So if you're running a parallel valve engine, you're 5 degrees more advanced than you should be. If you're running an angle valve engine, you're 10 degrees off. Okay, so um, this, uh, and again, that image showed we were at 40.6 for max advance, no jumper. So if, and there's there seems to be some debate whether it's 39.2 or 40.6. Mine read 40.6. When I spoke to Brad the other day, he said 39.2, and it may just be a display issue. We're not really sure, but still, that's a lot of advance for an angle valve engine and a lot of advance for parallel valve engine. Okay? So if you put the jumper in, okay, you're you're gonna fire at 26.6 degrees and it's gonna max out at 33.6. And some of us, and Andy, I think you're one of them, knocked it down. To, is that correct, Andy? Didn't you do this? Yeah, I put negative 1.4. Right. So that brought them down to 25.2. For high power takeoff cruise setting, uh, the takeoff setting, and for cruise, if you reduce the max advance, 32.2 so 32 degrees. Um, and Andy, what were your results? I brought the CHTs down, uh, you know, some, and you know, still plenty efficient for my taste at 10,000 feet. It's just a carbureted parallel valve 360. But you know, bringing the the one point, it's nice to full power at sea level, which is where I am here in Seattle. Um, you know, you're always at 25 degrees, and so you just, you know, that climb out. I already got plenty of heat uh, in the summertime as you start climbing, uh, due to all the usual reasons, and so keeping it at 25 has been really good. So if you've got uh, if you've got an angle valve, here is where. Um, we recommend that you want to set your angle valve to. 
So you need to customize. If you've got an angle valve engine, you need to come in and put in an offset of negative 7 degrees, okay, to get your angle valve down to just under 20 degrees. And you can put in, you know, you, you don't have to go 7 degrees. You can put in 5.6 and get you down to 21 degrees. But please do not run an angle valve without the jumper. And the jumper is still a little too fast. So you can use that DICAD program I showed you earlier to, uh, to adjust them. Or, and again, I don't want to make this a sales pitch. Or, you know, an EI commander will run um, You can do it and fly and monitor what's going on. One other little known feature of the um, PMAT is they have a built-in rev limiter. Um, so um, this this is what the PMAG default is. Uh, that may be hard to read. Is 33.28 degrees. So if you had a prop governor runaway, if your prop governor failed, if you have a constant speed prop at 3,328 RPM, the ignition will cut off. It drops. One notch below that, and it'll come back on with a bang. Because what happens is you pump raw fuel into the um, into the exhaust, and when it comes back online, it'll light the uh, the flame going out the exhaust will light it off with a bang. And I know from experience. So what we do with the EI Commander is we actually turn it down to 30.72, um, which is the next notch down. By default, so if if uh, you ever buy an EI Commander, you plug it in. First thing you have to do is tell it what ignition configuration you want so you know what you're dealing with. Because like I said, no jumper in, you plug the EI commander in, you're going to be running on that B curve. So you need to tell it you want to be on the A curve or a custom curve or what you want to be. Um, so we lower the RPM limit to 3072. It turns out that Lycoming has a spec, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, if you have an RPM excursion of over, I think, 10%, you need to overhaul it. Well, that gets you just just a hair over it. So hopefully it'll save your engine and save you from having an overhaul. The next step down is 2816. That is too close to the uh, cruise red line. <laughs> and you, do, uh, you can do it if you never get close to it. You can bump it down there. But uh, 3072 is, is my comfort zone. And that's, and, and that's a good point. All of this ignition stuff is what is your comfort zone? Where do you want to run it? I hear a lot of angle valve guys. The angle, the angle valve heads seem to be very good at cooling. Um, so I was talking to one guy the other day. He was running the B curve because I don't have temperature problems. And I asked him to give it a try, um, you know, at least put the jumper in and see if he gets more efficiency out of it. And I haven't heard back from him. And, and then I told him after he did that, because I think his airplane was heading off to the paint shop. After he did that, I asked him to go ahead and, and customize him down to the 19.6 and see what happens. So, any questions? Is, is that clear? <laughs> hmm. Is it just you and I left, Andy? Oh, we got oh we're all just watching. They're pondering these thoughts. I yeah. think that, you know, the thing that hit me early on is there's just, there's so many numbers and so many things are happening and you got two, you know, PMAGs going on and, you know, in flight and on the ground, and cooling and temperatures. And, you know, so it takes a little while when you first start flying with all this stuff to settle out on what exactly you want and what you're testing and what your results actually are. And I know Bill and I talk quite a bit in the early days as I was sorting out all that. So it's it happens, I think, to more people than than maybe post sometimes. Uh, that there is a bit of head scratching with this stuff until you understand it. Yeah, yeah. And um, that, that's a good point. So if you've got a new engine um, and you haven't done your first flight yet, and you're going to run PMAGs, so whether it's a parallel valve or an angle valve, what you can do is you can move this max advance down, and you can do it with, with his program. You can, you can bring the max advance down to match your engine. So if you've got a, a parallel valve engine, you can say don't advance more than 25 degrees. Just don't do it. And it will act like a fixed uh, timed uh, split magneto. And the advantage of doing that for the first 10 hours is it takes the ignition advance 
out of high cylinder head temperature issues. So if, you, if you've done that and you're doing your first flight and you have high CHTs, you know it's not your, it's, you know it's not your ignition, so it's either going to be your fuel-air ratio or baffles. Okay? And then after about 10 hours after you see your CHTs come down, then you can come back and, and play with these and start, and start putting it back and letting it advance. Does that make sense? Um, I think of what That's else. a nice simple way to do it for sure. I started at negative 2.8 on the shift curve so that it, it started even more conservative and wouldn't advance as far. And then over the first 10 hours, then I brought it up to negative 1.4. Yeah. So, so you were down in this one, Andy. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a neat system. I mean, it, and it does work. It, you know, it works really efficiently. I think I got another picture in here. Uh, T mag. Yeah. Yeah. So so this was the recommended configuration um, at a minimum. So it brings the max advance down a little bit and brings the advance shift down a little bit for for parallel valve. And again, the neat part is you can play with this. We helped a, one of the Reno racers this year with a fast glass airplane. And, you know, his assumption was more advanced was better. More advanced was better. He'd always been told more advanced was better. And he was running the stock B curve, no jumper in. And I chatted with him. And he put, he put the jumper in. He calls me back. And he's like, oh, my gosh, I picked up 15 knots. Okay. He goes, for him, at Reno, he goes, that changes his strategy of how he wanted to race. And after that, we started playing because he was running nitrous. We started playing with the advance shift, and we also capped his max advance to where he is. So he was running fixed time P mags at Reno with nitrous. And what I had him do is I had him go to 8,000 feet density altitude again, density altitude, do some speed runs, and then try then do the same speed runs at that setting at 6,000 density and and at 10,000. Because Reno, you never know what you're going to get. And then I had to do that with a bunch of different timing configurations. And so that way, the day Reno started, he looked at the barometric pressure. He knew exactly what his density altitude was. And he went to his little chart, and he said, this is what I need to be in. And he programmed it in, and away he went. So we're not all Reno racers. I can only... Did he win? No. Uh, the winning in, in the um, experimental class, the winning guy, I think it was a Lance Air 2 or 3 with a twin turbocharged thing he was pushing over 400 miles an hour with twin turbocharged six cylinder that's so, cheap uh, yeah and he got he uh, almost got hit on his uh on the bronze class that he was in and he pulled up and out so he was a dnf which is better to do that than swap paint so but but he was he's he's still going to run i think he's going to run again next year and and we're still talking about um, how to set it up and more testing for them. So, again, the, the goal is to figure out what the sweet spot for your engine is and, and run that, that proper time for that. But any questions? We've covered a lot. I mean, and what time is it here? We've been, we haven't been on that long. Um, I just uh, had a quick question about this advanced shift. Mm hmm. Um, I, yeah. I don't fully, I mean, I understand how the advance is beneficial. Um, but how is it occurring with uh, altitude? Like, is there a curve that you're following in there? or it, um, There's a standard curve that PMAG has in, and what you're doing is picking the section on that curve that you're going to run. And the, and the things that impact where on that curve it's going to set the timing has to do with RPM and then the manifold pressure contribution to that. Does that make sense? So the lower manifold pressure, the more advanced you're going to run for the same RPM. All right. The higher so manifold pressure. What's the relevance of this advanced shift negative 1.4 on, on the screen right now? Right. So let me let me come back to this. So that advanced shift, so it starts at 26.6. That's zero advanced shift. So by putting a it's negative just one the point, starting point shift. Okay. Yes. Sorry, so putting I'm a negative one point four in brings it down to twenty five point two for takeoff power, high manifold pressure. Does that make Basically, sense? 
think of no, it. I mean, it does. I, I was a little concerned. Like, what, why would? Why does it default to twenty six point whatever, um, twenty six point six? If ideally for these engines, they're supposed to be at twenty five anyway. Um, you would have to talk to the guys at Emag. Um, okay. And and why they, they you know their assumption was, I have a theory, and I don't want to um, talk to Spurgeon about our friends at. at <coughs> You may. Um, all I know is, is that my experience and the experience of a number of customers, Andy included, was take it down a notch. Now, um, just as we were testing this out, I found a crack on my engine mount. Or actually, uh, it rolled back into my tractor and that bent an elevator, which then led to the finding of the crack on the engine mount. But I want to go and run it down negative uh, 2.8 and see if my, CHC, my CHCs will definitely drop, but what will happen to my performance? In my case, with my RV9 with a stock O360, um, on the same day at the same altitude, because I can change it in flight with the EI commander, just doing dropping it a negative 1.4 degrees, I was able to pick up um, two knots of speed and watch my CHTs drop. And that was that was my again very clear. That was my experience. Um, you might find yours runs differently. Okay, maybe your installation. I mean, in but. Andy's case, right, near sea level, um, okay. Andy, were you able to quantify, you know, did, did you see any improvement in brake-specific fuel consumption or, like, how were you, apart from CHTs, that's great, they might have gone down, but what does that actually tell you about the efficiency of the operation of the engine? Yeah, I think at sea level, wide open, um, I felt like you did, which is the engine's supposed to run at 25. I don't need it up at 26 or higher. So you, you weren't so interested in efficiency or actual output. It was more about yeah, just exactly. looking after the longevity of the engine. Yeah, at full throttle down at level. For sure. And, uh, trying to find and remember. Remember the the max. I'd have to pull the manual out, which is behind me. But the max CHT for a light coming engine, uh, continuous power is like 435 degrees. Yeah. We all panic when I've we get a 405. <laughs> <laughs> you know, then I think the the corollary to that is, you know, what I found is then where I found the efficiency is, of course, up you know seven eight thousand feet when you're cruising. Um, that's where again. I was seeing, you know, plenty of difference in terms of reduced fuel flow at that point. You know, CHTs were no longer an issue. And being up at, you know, 32, 33 degrees um, was enough. At that point, I don't tend to, you know, you're not pushing the engine very hard. You're only running 65% or less um, at that point with a carbureted engine up at altitude like that. So it didn't really matter at that point. You didn't need any more advance than that was giving. And so, that negative 1.4 has really been a nice spot for just a out of the box stock setup because it <coughs> 25 and goes up to a nice advance and, and you're good. So you're only changing that zero point in the curve, so to speak. You're not changing that slope. So of course you're still seeing impact at altitude of that shift then, are you? Yeah, it's the same exact shift. It's just for every given RPM and manifold point, it'll just low it'll pick the next point down in the curve that it would have grabbed for that data mapping. And so everything's just a little bit more, you know, lower less advanced basically, um, depending on all those things. But it still advances just fine and, you know, goes with altitude and, and RPM and all that. You know, what I did notice when I first started flying, or when I had it at uh, negative 2.8, um, then at full throttle, you know, you can see on the chart there, you're running at 23 degrees. Um, and there, over time, I think, you know, you could feel a power difference even on takeoff of coming back up to 25, you know, at wide open full rich when you go out. And so that's where you kind of see that, you know, cutting in those specific high power situations, you know, you want to be at just the right spot. And I think just like Bill said, that pro that spot is probably different for different setups and ignitions and, or, you know, combination of fuel, fuel metering, you know, whether you're injected or carbureted in your setup in general. And, and even things like, um, do you have the snorkel or the regular, the, the regular, um, uh, 
filtered air box underneath with the straight end. All that stuff is impacts how easily your engine breathes. And so if that's how you change the offset, right? Can you change the slope of that curve as no. the manifold pressure changes? No, you cannot. You you can only change the max advance of how but where it where it starts to to pick off and how it changes with the PMAGs at this point you cannot do that. Okay. okay. And one last question. I'm sorry I've, I've so no, many, fine. but um the on the max advance, you know, you said that operating around that 3946 is is dangerous. Is there a a safe point where we could maybe reset that to, or is that not necessary? Well, you don't it, see that it, it, been an issue. it depends on the engine. So, so again, uh, an, a parallel valve engine would be more um, tolerant than an angle valve, and a Lycoming uh, C65. This is probably perfect. I, my theory is that the no jumper uh, B curve is ideal for a Continental 65 horse engine. And I think when they designed these, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they might have been thinking that most of the market would have been Continental engines, not realizing the biggest market is Lycoming's. Because it, it seems to but me if I was in. if I was at EMAG and I was and I was making these decisions, and I'm not, I would have set in the default to be perfect for a parallel valve engine. And then you have to take an action for an angle valve. And beyond that, you'd have to customize it. But so, Bill, where, where are we ever going to see those sort of high numbers? I mean, realistically, that's super, you know, super high altitude, you know, real low manifold pressure. Because well, I've just never seen those sort of huge numbers. No, the top for, you, for you and I, it's over here. This is for the, for the A curve. Um, so the 33.6 is the default A curve. Jumper in, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so basically, you see those numbers when you pull it back to half throttle when you're still at altitude, kind of thing. That will coast up to the max advance, but at that point, you're making hardly any power, so it really doesn't matter what the number is. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And if if you go up into the teens, the high, high, highest I've had mine is 17.5, and I was rated right at 33.6. I thought, you know, let me, I could do it, but at that point, I was running so efficiently. Um, you know, I posted that picture, you know, where I was doing 159 knots, um, burning 5.2 gallons an hour at 17.6 density altitude, you know, and that's carbureted, Lena Peak, and I wasn't wide open throttle because with a carburetor, you, to run Lena Peak, you kind of, you need that disruption of the airflow in there. So I wish I had thought to, to bump it up in uh, max advance and see what would happen, but... I've learned that those altitudes don't touch nothing. <laughs> so. No, those are great questions. I really appreciate them. Any any other questions? Any other thoughts or comments? Any cautions on how to plumb the uh, manifold pressure line to it, or you just tee it off and send it to both? Tee it, the, there is one, which is you want to make sure that you have some sort of restrictor in there to smooth out the manifold pressure um, display. Okay. Um, I've, I've had good luck with taking a, a, a 470, you know, button head rivet, uh, an eighth inch one, and taking the smallest drill that I have and drilling down through the dimple. The length doesn't matter. And you can, if you put that in the fitting on the cylinder head, it shouldn't, it should not move. I always caveat this because you do it, you screw it up. I'm not buying a new engine, but it shouldn't move into the engine and that will smooth the pressure coming out. We're not worried about volume. We're worried about pressure. Some people have used um, like a little quarter-sized um, uh, fuel filter for a lawnmower and just put it in the vacuum line. Um, things that we've discovered over time, um, if you install the PMAGs, they have uh, um, pin one on the PMAG should go to a case bolt. The other PMAG should go to a separate case bolt. Don't run them to the same bolt. Um, plumb them together, and when you time them, believe it or not, uh, take it above the T and puff in them so it sets both the timing on both at the same breath. We've had with the EI commander sensitive enough, we've had people set blow in one, set one uh, PMAG, walk around the aircraft, not touch anything, blow in the other one, and 
the EI commander will pick them up as a timing difference. And so we had when we found this out, the customer said, yeah, I had them teed together. I blew in them at the same time, and all was good. I mean, strange things like that. Um, yeah, don't put the don't put the PMAG ground to a forest of tabs on the firewall. You're not you're not trying to keep your firewall running. You're trying to keep your engine running. Um, yeah, those things. Does EMAG make or sell a little restrictor? I do not believe they do. Um, they looked at doing one for a while, a while, but they they do not. You could also, uh, you know, Van sells one for the fuel pressure line off the back of the engine. You could just pick that up. It comes with the basically the same kind of rivet deal pre-set up in the in the holder restrictor, so that it doesn't blow fuel out if the line breaks. Okay. Use one of those. Yep. Spruce, spruce sell them as well. Perfect. Yeah. And and I've, I've noticed that I've I've noticed some of the EFIS manufacturers smooth the manifold pressure programmatically, and some some do not. So. Some people say, well, I don't have any kind of restriction in mind. My manifold pressure is perfectly stable. And other people are like, yeah, it's all over the place with a different EFIS. So, so don't be fooled by your EFIS. Um, you definitely want some kind of um, restrictor in there. Hey, Bill, what's the uh, difference between the version 40 and version 41? Oh, okay. That's a great question. So what what they said was Tom did not like the – so. He, the two brains at, at EMAG, the guys behind it, Brad and Tom. Tom's the engineer, Brad's the sales guy. If you, hadn't, if you haven't met Tom, he's, uh, he's an interesting character, former nuclear submariner and all that good stuff. Um, but the, the difference between 40 and 41 is the transition to um, internal self-power is smoother. It doesn't just chop off. We've done, we've done some... Uh, testing and, and we may be coming out with a device that will t be able to tell you if the PMAC is running off of its own power or off of ship's power. And it, it he just didn't like the way it converted, so they just changed the software. That, that's really it. Um, you know, so you really, would, you, really would, you really wouldn't know you had a problem with it then, uh, I mean, you're okay with no. version 40. Right? No, no. I, okay. I sent mine out just to get them because I wanted the latest version because of all the testing we do with it. But if I had 40, I probably, you know, unless there was a reason to send them in, I probably wouldn't upgrade to 41. If I was if I was pre-40, I'd get them in. And we've talked about that online a lot. Um, 40, with version 40, they solve some of the lost timing issues. Um, the big thing is with version 40 and above, is they fire on in the starting mode, which is any time it sees less than 200 RPM, it fires the ignition at four degrees after top dead center, so you don't need to clock the PMAGs. Just plug them in and set them to top dead center, um, and it still starts just like a car. Are there so any serial numbers that won't take version 40? The the 113 models. It depends on which 113 you have. Um, and the 113s were the one without the cooling fins on the neck. What's new in 41? Pardon? What's new in uh, version 41? Oh, that's what we were just discussing. That That is, they changed, uh, they smoothed out how it cuts over to internal power, is their official um, description. Okay. I see. Other than and that's that, you change between 41 and 40? Pardon? Is that the only change between 41 and 40 that you know? They, that I know of, yes. Uh, for more details on that, please contact EMAG. I'm, I'm not an employee of theirs. I don't have all the internal, but that's what they posted um, on their website. So, okay. Um, yeah, and again, as I said, if you don't have version 40, at least version 40, please get them in. Um, so, the difference. Does anybody here have pre-version 40? Yes. Okay. So, what we discovered, um, and, and I give I give Brad and Tom credit because as soon as we figured it out, they they were they had a they had me at least to me within a week. So, what we discovered, if you have toggle switches rather than key switches controlling your ignition, and you start the aircraft up 
with one ignition powered or grounded, which means it's in setup mode. And it, like if you had two switches and you went to flip them on and you missed one and, and then hit the starter. It turns out that when the intake valve slams shut, you'll get a high intensity, short duration, positive pulse. It's not always negative. And it's just like somebody blowing in the tube. So what was happening is it would randomly reset the timing on that one ignition that was powered but grounded in the startup sequence. So version 40 solves that and won't allow that to happen. Now, if you have a key switch and both ignitions unground with the key switch on the start, you'd never see the problem. Okay. Also, uh, pre-version 40 fires the plugs in the starting sequence at top dead center. So if you've got a lightweight prop, even a metal, you know, metal prop, you know, you run a pretty good risk of having a kickback. So version 40 solved both of those. And that was one thing when they did it, we just asked them to, to shift the timing to after top dead center. And they, they quickly did both. Was that kickback a result of the switch uh, problem also, or just because? No. Just, I'd been hearing so much on the forum about people having kickbacks that when, when we discussed the, you know, the, the lost timing issue, and I, I, just, I just made the quip that it would be great if you could fire them after top dead center. And I asked, I asked for 1.4 degrees after top dead center, and they came back with, how about 4.2? <laughs> uh, okay. Saves on starters. It saves on starters. And it still starts like a car, so. so. Anyway. Um, that's it, unless you all have some more questions. I, I appreciate you coming out. Um, Thanks for being on. So if yeah. you've got any questions, you, know, you can get a hold of me on the forum, or you, you can um, you know, you can go ahead to the I Commander, and my phone number's on there. Feel free to give me a call if you have any questions. I've, I've answered more questions for non-EI Commander um, you know, people than I think I have for our internal customers. Hey, so. uh, can you hear me now? Yes. I've finally broken the code. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I, I found was a, uh, I have not run my engine with the key mags, but I, I did have a, uh, uh, a sensor, and instead of a restrictor, they had a, uh, apparently a very successful wadded up sh uh, chunk of shop towel stuffed in there. Uh, it, I, it, it apparently worked like a champ. I, I, I don't see any problem with that, but uh, no. I would highly recommend the, the drill rivet. It just seems more for them. Yeah, yeah there were, there, at one point they were recommending a cigarette filter material. And since I'm not a smoker, I didn't have access to that, so it was easier. Right. I'm, uh, I'm interested that the, uh, uh, the comments you were making, and I've been reading about the uh, uh, toggle switches, and uh, I, I did incorporate toggle switches, and I'm half tempted to uh, uh, even more aggressively put larger guards on them so that you get you get them there and you don't mess with them after you decide you're going to start it. Yeah. Um, so I, I talked to a gentleman uh, last week who was putting toggle switches on his, and he'd already um, had his panel custom silk screen and one of the things that he did he got some really neat switches where um, the idea was up would be run so powered and and ungrounded middle would be unpowered and grounded and then down would be a momentary push to uh, leave it ungrounded uh, and unpowered so you could test it neat idea the problem he's got is that he's going to have to turn that ignition while well, one ignition's off he's going to have to pass through off to his test mode. And when he does that, he's going to pump raw fuel into the exhaust, and then when the ignition comes back on, it's going to light off with a bang. And, and not really the best thing for your exhaust. So while I like that switch, I suggested he turn it upside down so that off would be unpowered and grounded. The middle position would be powered and ungrounded, then up would be ungrounded and unpowered for the test position. So that way yeah. he never passes through and off. That's exactly how I have mine wired. I have those mm -hmm. same switches that are momentary in one, you know, in the up position. Yeah, that. Yeah, he, he was doing it the other way, and I, I like your setup better, Andy. I think that's Yeah, cool. that way it's just down is off, up 
where they stay, which is really the middle, stays, you know, running and mm -hmm. that's normal. Yeah. And hey. test is all the way up into the spring. Yeah, and so you just turn one of them off and then the other one goes all the way up and that's your test. Bring the RPM down, you know, make sure it runs. And periodically you can, you know, bring it all the way down and then it'll die and just let it die. Don't try and catch it or it'll kick back or something crazy will happen. Been there. Let it die and then you can see the cutoff RPM and all that. Yeah, same here. <laughs> and, and in my case, I just have a simple three-way switch because I didn't know they had the fancy switches like Andy has. So for me, um, down is unpowered and, and grounded. The middle is unpowered and ungrounded. So that's that's internal generator test. And up is powered and ungrounded. So for me, they go all the way up for, for flight and then just go to the middle for um, so. and And do test your generators from time to time. Right at 500 hours, I had a generator pack it up. So it's just like a slick mag. I think it was, it was but, but one is still going at 900 hours and the other is... Uh, it was that one that I had rebuilt at 500. So, what uh, what uh, sort of feedback are you having on the uh, robustness of the uh, the bearing packs in the uh, PMAG? I know that um, uh, I recommend I seriously recommend people uh, uh, look at their magnetos at the 500 hour interval. Um, but I've heard some rumblings on uh, Vans Air Force about the the bearings themselves in the PMAG inexplicably packing it up. Like. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, really, you'd have to talk to EMAG to find out how frequently of an occurrence it is. For my personal experience, I've got almost 900 hours on mine. I've not had a bearing fail. However, with the EI Commander, we've had one customer, um, and I think we have over 200 uh, EI Commanders out in the field now, we had one customer who noticed that his timing divergence was starting to go. And when he pulled the PMAGs, it was a bad bearing. And, uh, and we had another, you know, you know, other things that we found with the EI commander. One guy was watching over a number of flights. The timing difference was, was uh, incrementally going up. And Never. he finally pulled them off. And the gear on the end of the PMAG, the actual uh, magneto gear, was starting to gall. And it hardly looked worn. But it was just enough to give a timing difference. Um, he changed the gears out, problem went away. Hmm. Um, not very, I'm, I am not familiar with how the EI Commander uh, interfaces. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, at this later date, am I going to have very uh, a major rewire involved in installing the EI Commander? No. No, it's a good question. Um, uh, we have a lot, a lot of people who retrofit them. It, the, the wiring that you have going to the PMAC stays in place. The wires that are required for the EI commander piggyback on the PMAC. So you just loosen the screw on the PMAC, add the extra wire, and then, uh, and then do it. And uh, Andy, you know, I'm, I don't want to sound like a sales guy, so Andy, you tell them what's involved. I mean, you've been through it twice. I mean, it's it's basically just a serial line, and so you can just run a, you know, a single line coming with that, just a ground and that, and you run them over to the EI commander. So it just needs ship power, right? You know, so ship power, ground, and then the two serial lines that run, you know, one each. Uh, and tax, and, and tax signal. And your tax signal, yeah, from each one. And so all of those just come together, and it's a little serial line that goes into the back of the EI commander. So you will have to, you know, run those wires and reach around underneath there but other than that should be pretty easy to put in whenever that sounds like a five twisted pair shielded or... um you could do that i mean i'm just running unshielded plain old you know tefso wire just a little bundle of that you know with each of the lines because you know short distance of serial lines don't need to be shielded or anything so no no let, let me tell you a great story so if you got time so we had a customer um, in Europe and it, who was telling us that when his ignition was running, um, the, TAC, the, the, the EI commander has a regular TAC function on it. And he said the TAC number wasn't matching the TAC on his EFIS. In fact, it was just an odd number. And it would go up and down with engine RPM. And we thought, oh, maybe it's the pulses per revolution. No, it wasn't that. 
And we went through this, and it would be one of these things where it would give an, uh, a bogus number if it was firing on both plug or both PMAGs, or if it was firing on the left PMAG, but it was okay on the right PMAG. And we had the same similar thing from a guy in Tennessee, and we couldn't figure out where we were scratching. Well, this guy, this guy over in Europe was extremely helpful, and, and he would we'd send him an email, and he would he would send us back within six to twelve hours and say, "I tried it, and and it was great." He, we eventually got to the point where we said, okay, unplug everything um, uh, or, or pull the, pull the tack signal out of the left PMAG, the tack wire, and put it over into the right PMAG with the right PMAG tack signal. So, so both tack signals for the I command were coming from the right ignition. And, and that's important to us because for the tack display, we only use the left ignition uh, tack signal. And he runs his airplane up, and he's still getting a bogus tack number. And we're like, what is going on? So then we had him disconnect both tack lines. So we weren't getting any tack signal. And when that left ignition was firing, sure enough, we were getting a bogus tack signal. So there was something wrong with either the spark plug, the plug wire, or internal coil pack issue with that left PMAC. Um, and, in fact, I need to send him a note because uh, it, we, we narrowed it down to which of the two uh, – uh, coil packs within the PMAG it was, and he was going to replace it, go to the hardware the local uh, auto parts place and get a, get another coil and replace it. So I don't know if it's a problem, but, but it was just an odd, duck, weird, you know, getting tax signals when you're not attached to a tax signal where it is, you know, we were scratching our head for probably six where months over there. Where do electrons go when they get lost? I'll tell you. I think they go the same place my odd socks are. Thank you. So, so, anyway, so really, the, the greatest benefit of having this is being able to see that divergence and knowing that you know you, you may have to look at a gear or a bearing in the PMAG. Yes, yes. It's think of it as a um, as an engine monitor for your ignition. Okay, because um, not only that, we had a, an early customer that um, had an occasional stumble. And he called us and he goes, hey, you know, I feel the stubble, and I noticed one of my, my bar graphs over on the right-hand side are going a little crazy, a little wonky. And, and we started asking us, well, what has changed? He goes, well, I did change my uh, uh, prop governor went bad, and I changed it. And he, and he thought about it. He goes, you know, I never resecured the plug wires. So he called me back the next day, and he said, you know what? I went and resecured the plug wires, flew it for three hours. The engine never stumbled. And the neat part was because – we're telling you which of the within two plugs which one is wrong. He said, "Yeah, that that number one wire on the left on the left PMAG was was rubbing against the engine mount and it was shorting out through the engine mount. I could see the burn marks." <laughs> so, just you know, perfect, huh? See, I, perfect. I like the other day. You know, I was climbing out and um, I had a CHT that just started climbing. You know, and pretty soon I'm just at pattern altitude and it's at 350, 400. 450, 500, 600, and then it just starts jumping up and down and up and down. But at the same, you know, while it was climbing like crazy, which in the end was just a probe wire that needed, re, you know, replugged together in those junctions, but while it's climbing, it's nice to look over at the I commander and see no alerts, no plug, you know, reporting of any kind, no timing divergence, everything's humming, and then you're like, well, this is, you know, we'll probably just ride this out and see what happens. And sure enough, you know, it's a sensor issue. So it's just extra instrumentation is really nice. I just painted my panel two days ago. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to cut just another small, uh, what, two and an eighth inch hole because it, it takes a small instrument hole. Never done, right? Never done. Okay. I'm, a, I'm on panel yeah, three how already. How the unit? Because I do have a spot beside the G5 in a sub-panel component I could cut it into. Are they a very deep unit? Or? No, they're, they're not. They're, um, Andy, if you, put, if you put me back on, I'll show you. I've got one. Oh, here, I can hold it up to my, my – there. So that's the depth of it. Oh, righto. Okay. So, so they're, and they, okay. they're designed to take a, the standard instrument hole. So you can yeah. plug them in, and if you want, this is sort of designed. We sort of stole the design from the Dynan uh, D10s. So you can um, flush mount it, or you can just surface mount it if you want. Your choice. And this one, 
go to Stein for the for the new one. Aircraft Spruce, we haven't we haven't sold enough to do it. We've the the new one's nice. It's 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 just a nicer unit. It looks better if you're doing a new panel. I'm, it's more expensive. I'll be honest. It is a lot more expensive. But uh, is it pin compatible? It is pin compatible, Andy. Uh huh. So maybe yeah. next Christmas. Next Christmas. And uh, so is this unit auto pink. dimming or what's the situation there? No, you have to. Um, you have to. You'll have to uh, trigger it to to dim it. But the new unit also does data recording. So Andy, for the data geeks among us, you can you, you can download it, and if you feel a stumble on your engine, you can you can go back and kind of do some analysis and see what's going on. And it's got a micro US port, a USB port on the front, and you just download to a to a, a USB stick, you know, thumb drive, and stick stick it in your uh, your uh, PC. You know, my first airplane was a 1941 Taylor Craft, and I never thought in a million years I'd have an airplane that I had to do software upgrades to. So. Anyhow, anything else? Well, great. Gentlemen, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Again, Andy, thank you very much for hosting us. It's been very helpful. You bet. It's been great. And I'll have a recording of it that we can post uh, in the next couple of days. So we'll get that up too. Fantastic. I appreciate that. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you all. Take care. Thanks a lot. Yep. Bye.